This is Laura Hayes, the Adult Services Manager at the Carroll Stream Library. Welcome, everybody. And this is Wendy Burden with the DuPage Organic Garden Club. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to let you know our next meeting is going to be Thursday, June 3rd. And the topic is going to be creating a shady garden respite by, and it's going to be presented by Master Gardener Nancy Bell. And today, our presenter is Heather Prince, and she's been part of the green industry for more than 20 years, including experience at the Morton Arboretum, Chicago Botanic Garden, The Growing Place, Piso Group, Wanamaker's Home and Garden, and she's now the associate editor for the American Gardener magazine. Um, it's a member a publication of the American Horticultural Society, and she's a professional garden writer and trained horticulturalist specially, specializing in trees, shrubs, and natives um, with a passion for connecting people with plants. And... Hello, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> there we go. So, we'll, of course, we'll you know, try to get all the throat clearing out at the beginning. Um, for housekeeping purposes, I think we're going to have folks put questions in the chat so that we can answer them all at the end. <clears throat> and, um, and and I think L Laura is going to uh, kind of take the charge on, on waving at me if uh, if we've got questions and so forth. So I do ask that folks mute themselves for the presentation so that I, so that we can, it's a lot uh, less distracting than uh, trying to keep um, track of everybody. So with that in mind, we are going, there is a link to the handout also in the chat in case you forgot it. Uh, and then at the end of the presentation, I will also post a link to the PDF of the presentation because it has all the plant details in there and it, it'll come in handy. <clears throat> so without further ado, let's go ahead and share. All righty, and then let me get my little laser pointer. So we're gonna talk native plants for the small garden tonight. Um, and first off, uh, why natives? So um, what I find uh, folks do ask uh, sometimes is why native plants? <clears throat> For me, native plants offer a sense of place. Uh, we live here in the Midwest and we have our own extraordinary ecosystems of prairie and woodland and wetland and savanna and some other, you know, dunes and some other great and wonderful um, wild places that you don't find anywhere else. So it is something to be celebrated and embraced uh, because you know it's, it connects us to the place that we're in. Uh, natives can also be a perfect solution to a challenging area in the garden. There is a native plant for every place, every kind of plate soil, every kind of light and everything in between. Uh, pollinators and wildlife. So native plants are in many ways our best hosts for a huge array of insects, birds, reptiles that we've already, maybe not all of the, maybe not a bearded dragon, but our salamanders and frogs and such, uh, as well as our mammals. And so, and they kind of give you an opportunity to create that oasis in your own backyard for our wild creatures. As we are uh, challenged with climate change, uh, this is probably the first dry spring we've had in some like, or like five or six years. So all of those rain, <laughs> My rain garden is getting, uh, having to water the, the bottom of the rain garden right now. And um, I, that's not something I enjoy doing, but you know, come what may, I was hoping for more rain this morning. Um, <clears throat> the other question I, that I, I run into quite frequently is you know, natives or cultivars, what's, what's the big deal? So um, we, of course, uh, I think as we all know as gardeners, we are tinkerers. And uh, so when uh, we just can't leave well enough alone now, can we? Uh, but uh, cultivars are, of course, our bread for particular traits. Things like flower color, disease resistant, bloom time, either making things bloom earlier or later or longer. And in some cases, um, as we've tinkered with these plants, our cultivars have reduced the resources for the fauna that depends upon them. And so and that's one of the reasons why native plants have become more and more popular as we learn more about how our um, food webs work and 
what is needed to keep our, our butterflies and bees, for example, happy as we all try to navigate it the world that we live in. <clears throat> so hydrangea arborescence is a really good example of the, the differences or the, in between a straight species native and a cultivar. So our, our, this is our native hydrangea. This, I took this photo in Starved Rock a few years ago. And our native hydrangea arborescence has a lot of fertile florets in the center and just kind of a little handful of sterile florets on the edges just to say, you know, welcome our little uh, pollinator friends and kind of go, hey, hey, here we are. Uh, but all the nectar and the pollen is really in these little tiny fertile florets. So Annabelle hydrangea, which was actually developed in Anna, Illinois, uh, was a, is a sport of um, the straight species. And it's got all of these uh, sterile florets to be bigger and showier and look great and, and be quote unquote prettier. <clears throat> so this doesn't feed nearly the pollinators that this one does. Um, another example of this is Echinacea purpurea, our, uh, our purple cone flower, which really, I don't think there's ever one without a bee on it, <clears throat> but it is certainly nice when they pose for the camera, isn't it? Uh, so this is straight species purpurea, and it's going to have that flat uh, daisy flower with both, you know, with the ray flowers and the disc flower. So there's two different types of flower. And of course, this one is a, you've always got insects on it. It's got tons of ne you know, nectar. It's very nectar rich pollen um, resources for our insect fed. Um, well, you know, marmalade, which is one of the Echinacea purpurea cultivars, they have gone ahead and kind of tinkered with those disc flowers and made them bigger and showier and poofier. So it's very pretty, but what because they because we have um, tinkered with the nectar producing parts of the flower, it does not feed as much as the plain you know quote unquote plain daisy flower. So and there's a, a new report out from the Mount Cubicena out, Cubicena out east uh, that did a um, several year trial of echinacea cultivars, and they also took a look at how many insects were, land, you know, were using the plants. And they found that across the board, the daisy flower um, was the most visited flower type. So, um, and it didn't necessarily matter what color the petals were. Uh, one of the top three was actually a white echinacea called Fragrant Angel, uh, Pow Wow Wild Berry, which is a pink is another one. Um, but, you know, orange petals, yellow, white, pink, didn't matter uh, as long as it was in that that daisy form, um, whereas the, the kind of puffball ones were really not <clears throat> particularly favored by insects. So that's just sort of another little, when we're looking at cultivars and we, um, for the garden, sometimes, uh, and we'll run into a few, and there's one in particular that we'll talk about later in this presentation, that uh, they because of what was um, changed in the plant, it still does the job of feeding things. It just is maybe a little bit more upright. So, um, and then I wanted to give you just some examples of some native uh, plant gardens. Uh, this one we have uh, is in the summer with our wonderful queen of the prairie. Uh, and it gives you a loose, you have different weights of flowers with the kind of, you know, the saucer flower of the um, Echinacea, the Monarda, which is like a little mini firework, and then the Philopendula, which is like a giant, is kind of sort of cotton candy sort of flower. So lots of different textures in this garden. <clears throat> if you're not already familiar with Denise Sandoval, a good natured landscape, she is a natives only landscape designer, and she's created this wonderful, rich uh, border for this, this little walkway. And we've got all kinds of different flowers, and this looks like it's blooming in probably about June late June, um, so because we still have some penstemon, and then, uh, but there's going to be lots and lots of pollinators in this garden with lots of different floral um, resources and different flower shapes from, okay, and we've got some Echinacea pallida, but we have also the tubular flowers of the penstemon, the flat flowers of the Asclepias, and so each of these flowers attracts different insects as they've co-evolved to use those floral resources. <clears throat> 
And this one, we've got some trees and shrubs and grasses and flowers as well. So a little bit of everything to feed everybody and a bird bath for a little, uh, a little drink and a little, uh, pool, a little pool time for the robins. And it gives, again, a really lovely layered mixed border. <clears throat> Okay, and we uh, also a couple examples from the Chicago Botanic Garden actually, um, with different, you know, a little more shadier grasses. And this is one of our uh, wonderful hibiscus. And then this one is in the height of, of August with our tall prairie plants, just to give, um, give you some ideas on using things. Um, Carex, we're going to touch on a few of the sedges. We have a few hundred sedges native to Illinois, but we're going to look at a few of the ones that are the most available. This is Pennsylvania sedge used as a ground cover, and you can see how it just sort of softly wave drifts over and creates these wonderful textural waves. And this is Carex radiata, which is a much more of an upright little grass, but this is, makes a terrific little short ground cover for the front of the border. <clears throat> In the woods, in our shade, we can always mix and match things. So we have our wild geranium, our wild phlox, and some of our shorter sedges so that we can we have different weights of the leaves and different weights in the flowers to give us something that's really a, a rich and varied composition. So we're going to go ahead and jump into the plant. So I kind of, I've divided the plant list into sunny and shady, wet to dry to average. Uh, so, and having to narrow this list down is always a challenge because there's always more that we can talk about, uh, but we only have an hour. So we're, we're trying to keep it to an hour. Uh, so we're gonna jump in, of course, with milkweed. Everybody is, I think, aware of milkweed and uh, it's poster child butterfly, the monarch. It's again, it's so nice when they pose for you, isn't it? Um, so swamp milkweed is going to be about four feet high and it tends to have, uh, it grows stem by stem. So it's not a big dense clump. It's more of a looser, a little stem here, a little stem there. And so it tends to weave in through a garden bed. And we are starting with sunny, wet, wet to moist soils. Not that we have them right now, because of course, you know, dry spring, uh, but you, I don't even know if I should say typically anymore. Um, Hopefully we will get some decent rain in the next few weeks. I was hoping for more to this morning. Um, but swamp milkweed will take wet to average soils. <clears throat> so things, so literally swampy soils up to sort of everything in between. Um, and not only the milkweeds, not only are hosts to uh, our wonderful monarchs, but they also host a whole bunch of other different species of insects. From uh, I am rather fond of the unexpected Cygnia moth because I want to be on the moth naming board. Uh, I'm not quite sure what's so unexpected about it, other than it may have a little flat. It has a little flash of orange on the hind wing, but it's you know I'm not. Does it pop up at parties? Who knows? Uh, and then our milkweed tussock moth, which sort of looks like Don King with a bad dye job. But uh, there's all sorts of other things like milkweed bugs and milkweed beetles that live on milkweed. So it hosts a number of different things. Philippentia ruba, the queen of the prairie. And I, I know I love this plant. I think it's perhaps an apt common name. It is, uh, granted it is five feet high, but it, it tends to be a slowly forming clump. I have, um, mine is stem by stem kind of getting bigger. It's not a fast mover, uh, but boy, you get these huge cotton candy fl uh, flowers in June and they're about the size of your head. Um, they're a wonderful in a vase. And then we also have a coarser leaf, this palmately uh, compound leaf in a red stem. So lots of ornamental uh, qualities in Queen of the Prairie. And who doesn't love a giant pink flowering plant? <clears throat> Plus on the another bonus, is it's not tend, the bunnies don't tend to eat it. And I'm coming to you today from my home office and my, my window in front of me looks out to the backyard and I'm watching, I can, oh, the two rabbits are back. I call them the fossers, the fat old smart rabbits that have outwitted the hawks, the owls, the coyote and the foxes. So they're off, I don't wanna know what they're eating. I just, I can't walk, I can't look. Um, but they're not eating the Philip Angela. 
Uh, hibiscus lavis. So we do have two species of hibiscus native to Illinois. We also have a native petunia and a native impatient. Uh, so this is a lavis, which has a little bit more of a um, lobed leaf than the mashudos, uh, which is our other species. And this is a plant that uh, is the parent of our dinner plate hibiscus. Uh, so as you probably, if you're familiar with those, you know that they they need their being a hibiscus, they want to be warm before they're going to turn up in the yard, which some years is June and sometimes it's even July. Uh, but it, you know, this year I, I suspect we were, we've been warm early, so I think they're going to pop up sooner. Uh, and we should ex expect to see them in June and they'll bloom all the, through the summer. This one needs to have good moisture to be truly happy. It's a bottom of the downspout plant, bottom of the rain garden plant. Uh, you can find really wonderful stands of it at Little Red Schoolhouse Forest Preserve in Southern Cook County. Uh, and it is literally on the edge of the lake. So um, the other wonderful thing about hibiscus is not only is it big and showy and dramatic, it's also host to the gray hair steak, painted lady, and checkered skipper butterflies, as well as several moth species. Um, and I, I think moths sometimes get uh, undervalued because we don't necessarily, you know, if they're nocturnal, we don't necessarily see them, but they are really key pollinators in the food web. One final thing with hibiscus, if you have a chance, uh, is that uh, the Lincoln Park Zoo was recently, in 2019, is one of the only accredited uh, hi perennial hibiscus collections in the country. They have 75 cultivars, and I, it is on my list for a July visit. Um, Liatris spicata marsh blazing star. So this is the Liatris that likes to be wet, have wet feet. Uh, it's going to form a big clump if it's happy, and it's going to send up these wonderful tall wands of flowers in um, late June and blooms through most of the summer. Uh, all the Liatris as a group are just magnets for bees and butterflies and moths and wasps. Pollinators love them. There's always something on it. Uh, it's one of my husband's favorite plants because he thinks he calls it good plant TV. Uh, there's, he likes to sit on the patio and just see, see what's going on, um, always hopping. And then also, you know, it's a great cut flower. So something for the bugs and something for us. Uh, Lobelia cardinalis, the cardinal flower, is one of those extraordinary red blooming native plants. It is like fire engine red. Uh, and this is another one that's going to just sort of do a stem here, a stem there, but the hummingbirds will, will seek it out and they will find you. It's one of their favorites uh, with those because it has a tubular flower to it. And so anything with long tongues, butterflies and hummingbirds really love it. Uh, again, if, fortunately, the bunnies don't seem to like it. And um, you'll often get our big bumblebees on it as well, our long, <clears throat> our long tongue bees. Uh, Lismachia quadriflora. So this is one of those native plants that has a potential to be aggressive if it's happy. If it's wet, it's going to spread quicker. If it's drier, it's going to be better behaved. But it gives you the sort of little airy yellow confetti of um, summer bloom. And the, it's the small bees and our, our little seerfit flies and predatory wasps really love it because it's very accessible. Uh, and there is a specialist bee that feeds on the nectar. So there's one bee that only eats uh, prairie loosestrife. And um, so this one's one that if you uh, are looking for a plant to kind of weave through a wetter garden, this is certainly a possibility. It's only about knee high. So it tends to kind of drift in and out um, for you. Uh, Zizia aurea, the Zizia is blooming right now, and, and it is in our carrot family, and so it's the host of black swallowtail butterflies, and uh, it has these wonderful umbilate bright yellow flowers. Uh, this one is our wet, is our water-loving Zizia, uh, so it's a great rain garden plant, and um, the small are tiny little things like sweat bees, our seraphid flies, whose larva is almost as, if not might be even better predators of aphids than ladybugs. The adults nectar on these 
wonderful tiny little umbulate flower. So no matter the flower, there, there is a bug for to pollinate it. It's also a wonderful nectar source for some of our predatory wasps that like to lay eggs on tomato hornworm and take out tomato hornworm for us. So we always like to have some of those little tiny flowers available to our, um, our beneficial insects. So for average soils, and this is kind of that run-of-the-mill soil, not quite silky wet, not quite bone dry, but kind of in the middle, um, one of my favorites is New Jersey tea, uh, Ceonanthus americanus. It's, it's a lovely, tidy, three foot by three foot shrub. Um, it's a slow grower, so it's, it's not, it's going to slowly get to three feet, which makes it a really nice foundation plant. It's easy to add in, um, in a garden bed or you know tucking a perennial border uh, but it blooms in May it's blooming now uh, and into June and it's a I mean you'll always have things buzzing on it uh, it's ho it's also a host species to several moths and small butterflies so we want holes in the leaves because that means somebody's eating it and calling it home the other um it's called New Jersey tea. The leaves have been traditionally used as a tea uh, by Native Americans. The other wonderful use that I, that that's used, for, a number of parts of it are used, but one of the fun ones for me, <clears throat> uh, a, little, a little native plant trivia is the flowers on this are, um, are so terrific. So you can take the flowers and rub them between your hands under water and they will form a lather and act as a mild soap. And I, I can tell you, I've tried it and it works and they have a wonderful fragrance. So certainly it's something to think about. Um, Echinacea pallida. So it's because we all know and, and love our Echinacea purpurea and you know everybody loves purple coneflower and how can you pass up pink daisies? Uh, but I, I, I put in pallida because for me it has a lighter, airier texture to it. Kind of looks like hula girls with those wonderful strappy petals and it gives you a really different sort of texture in a flower, but with all the benefits of that cone flower. Uh, and the other thing <clears throat> with echinaceas is, is they are, not only are they pollinator magnets, but they're host to the silvery checker spot butterfly, and the, the finches, goldfinches especially, just devour those seeds, and they'll seek out echinacea, uh, and you'll have those birds these bright yellow uh, birds or the uh, the house finches with their little red heads um, pipping around your garden and checking them out. I like to leave some, um, I will cut some echinacea for the house, but I try to leave a good amount in the garden as well for, for the birds. And it looks, it, it stands up all winter and gives you some winter interest. Um, Hucra richardsonia, this is one of our native hucras and uh, prairie alum root. It is, mine is, let's see, mine's almost blooming. It's sort of not quite there yet, but it's getting there. Uh, and it has a white to light green flower on it that the bees really like. However, and this is where I have to get out the bunny repellent if I'm going to see my, my fosser buddies, uh, the rabbits do tend to take a nibble. So um, it's sort of a low profile plant where it doesn't really, uh, it kind of, you know, hangs out in the background, uh, but it, um, then it turns this amazing purpley orangey red in the fall and you remember why you planted it because <laughs> you're planting it for the fall color so it's a really adaptable plant um and if i actually like to use the flowers as filler in a vase so something something to consider uh, monarda fistulosa so monarch all the plants in the on this list today monarda is probably the most that and those lamachia are the most aggressive they like, they're going to be uh, better behaved with competition or if you stress them out. Um, so the drier, you know, they're kind of, uh, but still so worthwhile because they are so uh, used by pollinators. Um, Monarda, wild bergamot or bee balm uh, is, the hummingbirds love it, the butterflies like it. Uh, it's edible, it's in the mint family. So it has square stems, and then the bunnies don't eat it because it's got fuzzy leaves and that are fragrant. So I tend to take a nibble on it when I'm out browsing the garden, <laughs> literally. Uh, but you can, uh, I like it in iced tea, or if I'm feeling fancy with a garden party, I'll float, I'll float the flowers in the punch bowl. Uh, the other thing I find that, that with Monarda is if you take the time to um, to do some ob insect observation in the garden, you might also notice the bumblebees 
um, like to cheat with them. And they'll slit the base of the, pe the petals right, right above the calyx and they'll get the nectar from the side because they're like, I have a long tongue, I can get down there, but it's so much easier and I don't have to spend the calories and I'll just gonna cheat and, and slice it open and go in. Uh, it's called nectar robbing and you, you see that on um, the cardinal flower as well where they just like, you know, the bees are just over it by the time they're blooming and hungry. Uh, Rosa blanda is one of our native, we have about a half a dozen native roses. Um, Rosa blanda is a nice um, organized five foot by five foot. Uh, with a flower, oh, probably about the size of your palm. It's very, it's really large and showy, and it's what we call, you know, the simple flower rose. It's not a, uh, but it kind of gives you that classic prairie um, effect of a, a kind of that classic wild rose look to it. Uh, and also, as being a rose, blooms in June. Uh, you'll usually find this is that's so well when they pose, nice when they pose, but you'll, it's lots of bees just, they just love roses. Um, it's also the larval host of several moth species. And I chose this photo because we've got um, some uh, holes in the leaves up here where it's kind of cut out like a little C and that's some of our leaf cutter bees in action. Um, and uh, the, um, I've got a couple questions in the chat. You know what? And I'm going to get those at the end because I have some links for the, for, for, for them. And I want to, that I want to share with you guys. So I did see them, but we'll circle, we'll circ circle back at the end. Um, the nice part about uh, our wild roses is they also have a really good rose hip set. So they'll have a wonderful, um, they have lots of fruit on them. And this one also will have a touch of fall color. So our rose hips, of course, for, for the critters, but also for us. Uh, and, you know, they have a lovely uh, light rose fragrance. Shazacrium tuparium, little blue stem, I think is probably hands down my favorite grass. So this is one of those grasses that the cultivar may be a better choice than the street species because the cultivars have been bred to keep those grass blades upright. Uh, but little blue stem has this lovely steel blue foliage, and then in the fall it turns caramel, blonde, mauve, burgundy, red. It's just a kaleidoscope of fall color. Stunning. Uh, the, it goes anywhere from average to dry. You'll find it in the prairie. You'll find it in the dunes. Uh, and the foliage is host to several skipper butterflies. So when they did the um, reproductive strategy for little blue stem is when it's set seed is that it flops over and drops its seed next door. So the straight species can be exceptionally floppy late in the season because it's dropping seed. So what they did when they when the cultivars have all been sort of uh, bred to be more upright, so they haven't changed necessarily the um, the leaf structure at all, other than make it more upright. So you're still going to get. It, it's still going to be used as a larval host. It just won't maybe flop around the yard as much. Um, uh, Sporabolus, Northern Prairie Drop Seed. Uh, this is a favorite of everyone with this wonderful, soft, just very soft and flowy texture to it. And then it turns this really wonderful kind of caramel blonde in the fall. Uh, and it's a very well-behaved kind of slow growing grass. It's, it's going to take a while to get it to, to this size. Um, and the birds love the, uh, the seeds. When it blooms, it's very fragrant. Uh, and I have found that with this grass, it's very idiosyncratic on how you, what it smells like to you. I've had folks tell me, oh, it's fresh linen or popped popcorn in my house. For me, it smells like sweat socks. So I can't do it because it's too much like sweat socks. But um, if you if you love the fragrance, absolutely go with it. Uh, but it, it's um, so I did have a question: Is Rosa Blanda very invasive? Uh, that is a question. I'm going to answer that now. Uh, for our purposes, if it's a native plant, by very definition, it's not invasive. We'll use the term aggressive. Um, the roses, as a group, our native roses don't tend to be terribly aggressive. Uh, they will pretty much stay put. Uh, they may sucker a little bit, but they're not gonna sucker as much as rose as rugosas, for example, which really can send some, some runners out, but it, it tends to stay put. Um, and then, uh, so in, 
when we're talking definitions between invasive and aggressive and native, we usually consider native plants to be aggressive as opposed, and then the plants that are not native to here are often referred to as invasive. So it's just a little terminology that sometimes um, will, we just wanna make sure we're all talking the same language. Um, so we're still in sunny, but now we're gonna kind of move into some dry soil options. Um, Asclepias tuberosa or butterfly weed. This is a very polite two feet by two foot clumper, stays in this lovely rounded shape, and it is orange. <laughs> um, it does all the jobs of milkweed, being a larval host to the monarchs and all the other fun things, as well as being a wonderful nectar plant. It is happiest in good drainage and really rocky to gravelly. Uh, or poor soils. I can get butterfly weed to last maybe two years in my gardens. I'm in Downers Grove on um, old soil and I have really black clay loam, which tends to be really rich. And so, and I struggle to grow prairie, some of the prairie plants because it's too rich for them. Uh, I've seen butterfly weed be successful in a number of situations. Um, the other note on the Asclepias is they do handle a little bit of shade. So it's, um, People, you know, don't remember that, but they can take some light shade. And of course, beloved for that wonderful orange color. Uh, Sclepius reticulata. So this is one of our, we got about a dozen species of milkweed native to Illinois. Um, I'm finding more and more, you can, you can find Asclepius reticulata very available, world milkweed. It's very deceptively delicate in its texture. It looks sort of like Amsonia with those little needle-like leaves and these cute little white flowers. But despite that, it only gets maybe, you know, two, 18 to 24 inches tall. So it's a short, more front of the border Asclepius. And it just sort of weaves in and out from other, with other plants. So it's very polite and it gives you a lovely delicate texture. Uh, and it still acts as a larval host and as a nectar source, but it's something a little different in an Asclepius. <clears throat> Baptisia bracteata. Of course, we have a number of Baptisias that are <clears throat> native, but I was, um, I think we're all pretty familiar with Baptisia australis, which is wild indigo, you know, blue, um, blue wild indigo. Um, bracteata, though, I chose because it is a much smaller plant. It's only about two feet high and two feet wide, and it has these wonderful white, large white tresses of creamy. Uh, flowers with a touch of a touch of yellow to them, and uh, blooming um, soon. And uh, but um, with the other Baptisia, it's host to several moths and butterflies, and the uh, pollinators love those flowers. Uh, but this one um, will is just a little bit smaller, and it handles those dry soils and those maybe even a little bit gravelly. So that sacrificial strip between two driveways where you can like everybody kind of struggles to get things to grow. This is certainly a candidate and you can see over it when you're backing out of the driveway. Um, back, my Baptista Australis, uh, before it got shaded out by the trees at one point, I swore it was about the size of VW Buck. So this one's much shorter and can tuck into a garden. Uh, Delea purpurea, purple prairie clover. Uh, it's just, the, it's a delicate, uh, cute, Sweet little plant. It looks like little uh, tutus, you know, ballerina tutus, and um, the uh, it's unfortunately the rabbits adore it. So this is one if you want the plant in the garden, it's certainly worth growing. Just keep you know if you've got a dog, awesome, or keep that rabbit repellent at hand because uh, they kind of all the clovers are, are are bunny food. But it, it's a wonderful little pollinator plant for all of the little bitty bugs. Um, and you'll have some little of the skipper butterflies on it as well. And it blooms almost all summer. So just a lovely small plant. All right, uh, Parthenium integrifolium, wild quinine. I have a soft spot for this one. It's got big, beefy, coarse leaves to it. And then these clouds of little white flowers for our small predatory insects. Um, and it blooms all summer long. It's incredibly tolerant of soils 
and it's got it's going to have little bugs on it all the time, but it also makes a wonderful cut flower uh, for the for the house. Uh, I think is with anything white goes with everything. You can't ever miss. Um, and it even can be a, if you wanted to do a white or an evening guard, it's certainly a candidate. <clears throat> sedum ternatum, which is blooming right now. This is our native sedum. We have a native sedum, who knew? Uh, it's only about three to six inches tall. Uh, it makes a terrific short ground cover and it takes part shade. So it'll go full sun to part shade really easily. <clears throat> and you'll have lots of bee activity with these starry white flowers. It's kind of sort of magical. Um, I love, of course, with all the sedums, uh, they like good drainage. They like to be hot and dry. Uh, and then the, that's their happy place. Uh, I actually tried to, pl I plan a row, I've got a row going of mixed sedums um, along the driveway, uh, because if we're unloading the car and you, you step into the flower bed, they can handle a little bit of foot traffic and, they're, and they just shake it off and keep on going. Uh, Sylphium um, prairie dock. So prairie dock is, of the sylphiums, I find probably the best behaved. <clears throat> it's got these, those leaves are about two feet long. They're huge coarse texture in the garden. It gives you almost a tropical look. Uh, and it's one of our prairie plants. And that prairie dock, those leaves do sort of twist and follow the sun during the day. It has a tap root probably to China. So it doesn't like to be moved. Uh, and then it sends out these tall, um, stiff flower stalks uh, in about August. Um, and so with a little yellow daisy flowers on the top of them, like little Sputnik flowers kind of hanging out in the breeze. Uh, but it's, so the bees love the flowers, but what's really fun about the flowers on Prairie Dock are the goldfinches. Um, my, uh, I've got uh, three plants in, in my, my big rain garden at the top level where it's dry and the um, goldfinches kind of, once it starts to bloom, the goldfinches stalk them. <laughs> They're checking them every day. Is it ready yet? Are the seeds ready yet? And they clean them out like, uh, like a um, really really quickly. And then um, so the um, the other um, thing with uh, prairie dock is when the leaves dry, they're a wonderful uh, dried arrangement kind of leaf because they they'll curl and they'll twist. And because it's a sylphium, they're very sandpapery and they have some wonderful pores. It's just a really fun uh, dried plant. And I, and I see we're getting lots of questions and I appreciate that. We'll get, we'll, we will get to them, I promise. <clears throat> so now we're moving to the shady characters, this, the shady side of the street. And Asarum canadense, wild ginger. Um, it's a terrific native ground cover. It's really happy in, in wet soils. You'll find it mostly growing in, um, in the woods in the, on a stream bank. Um, but it will tolerate it will tolerate up to you know average soil. So uh, the fun part for um, it's, it, it tends to form these dense colonies. It really gives you a carpet effect. Um, but <clears throat> it is one of our native plants that has a reproductive strategy designed around ants. So if you get down on your hands and knees and then lift up its skirts, you can see its little purple urn-like flowers. Um, and then when it sets seed, those seeds have what we call an oleosome. So it's a, a structure filled with carbohydrates and fats and sugars that's attractive to ants. And so the ants pick up the seed, take it home uh, to the nest, the larvae eat the sugary parts and leave the seed behind. And that's that's sort of, that's their strategy to uh, spread ginger around. So I find in my yard that I, I'll have my big patches and then I'll have some outliers that kind of turn up piggly piggly. And I, I either move it where I want it to or, or let it kind of settle in and see what it's gonna do. Um, you can also use the roots maybe substituted for the spice. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm, I might do, this may be the year. Uh, Carex crystallatella, this is crested oval sedge, and this is one of our wetland or, or watery sedges. Um, and I chose this one because it has these wonderful seed heads on it. Um, with all of the sedges, our host, our larval host for butterflies and moths. And then the songbirds consume the seeds. This one's about a three footer. This is a bigger one. Um, 
you might also find uh, like Carex vulpinoidea is a bit similar, a little different in the seed head though. Uh, and sedges are, um, their seed heads tend to be the most ornamental feature other than that grassy texture in the garden. So this is definitely one that's happiest with extra water. Uh, Carex muskegamensis, palm sedge. It's called palm sedge because it tends to stack its leaf uh, leaves on a stem. So it has a lot of dimension in the foliage. Instead of just being a grassy mound, you can see how it's kind of twisted and um, turned and sort of, it's just, it's really lots of interesting texture. Um, also about three feet high. Mine has, re it started on the second level, the uh, wet to dry level of my rain garden. It reseeded itself to the bottom where it seems to be a bit happier. <clears throat> so plants, <clears throat> Sorry about that. Plants do like to <laughs> will occasionally move on you. Uh, but with all, again, what a wonderful resource for uh, our, our butterflies and moths, and as well as our little songbirds who will finish off the seeds. So um, sedges are blooming uh, right now. They might be on the tail end of their flowering. Uh, and of course, my rabbit friends ate the flowers off my one sedge, so so much for that spreading by seed. But um, they will also slowly expand um, by rhizome. Um, Hortensia virginica is our Virginia bluebells are just sort of our kind of starting to finish up blooming right now. Um, and this is one of our ephemeral wildflowers, but it's such a gorgeous blue. And it's uh, one of those, because I had that really nectar rich tubular flower, bees and butterflies, and moths, anything with long tongues, just love them. Um, and you'll get the early hummingbirds on these as well. So <clears throat> they'll bloom in April into May, depending on the year maybe two feet high um, and they do prefer extra moisture. So, uh, but in, it's a plant you wanna plant with other things like hostas and ferns so that when they go dormant in July and disappear, you have things to fill in the gaps. Um, but it's such a classic spring flower for us and that blue is just extraordinary. Um, speaking of wet lover, so Anaclea sensibilis, sensitive fern in many ways is a wetland fern, but it gives you this big coarse leaf. Um, it's called sensitive fern because sometimes they will uh, be a little hit by frost, but depends on the year. Um, and I, I don't find, they bounce right back. So it's not like it's super sensitive. So <clears throat> kind of a misnomer in the common name, uh, but it has to be wet to be happy. Uh, my parents are in Western Springs and their back 20 feet is turned into swampland with all the new housing. Uh, my mother's sensitive fern is very happy because it's their backyard gets squishy with half an inch of rain. Um, so, but it's a really different ferny texture. Uh, Pensamen calicosis, uh, calico beard tongue of our penstemons. This is the one that likes to be wet uh, and will handle wet soils where soils are always, always wet. Um, with all the penstemons, this is a hummingbird favorite that has really rich nectar sources and the hummingbirds will seek it out. Um, so, and it has a little bit more of a lavender flower on a darker stem, so quite ornamental. Uh, bees, you know, and you'll get some bumblebee butts in there too, um, but they are definitely a, a June flower for us. Beautiful in a vase. And the penstemon as a whole is a, is a pretty easygoing genus of plants. Um, our native penstemons. We have some new penstemons coming on the market that are native to the Rocky Mountains. Those are much more acclimated to uh, dry, rocky soils too. So um, it's certainly worth trying uh, and, and see how they do. But if we're looking for a, a native, um, then we have plenty of our own. Uh, Phlox de Vericata is blooming right now. Incredibly loving, just fragrant, really loving, uh, nice, uh, sweet fragrance on phlox. Um, and this is our taller phlox. <clears throat> um, again, great pollinator plant, uh, beautiful lavendery blue flowers. Uh, and it's much, it's a very wet tolerant phlox, not all our phlox is, but this one is. And gives you just a soft roundy mounty clump of, of plant. 
Um, Aquilegia, so we're gonna switch over into average soils. Our Aquilegia canadensis, I know somebody mentioned that their columbine is blooming. Uh, they should be blooming uh, with that wonderful classic lantern shaped flower. <clears throat> Hummingbirds really adore it, bumblebees like it too. And I like to let it go to seed. And once those seed capsules start to pop open, I'll either crush them or I'll just fling them around the yard because I like this, pl this plant's very soft and it's easy to scatter um, and let it kind of weave its way through the, a woodland garden uh, just to give you little, little sparkles of red and yellow in the spring. So, um, <clears throat> and it's one of those plants that if, if we do run into issues, or you want to keep it controlled, cut the seed heads off, and it'll just form a nice clump of foliage, uh, kind of that leafy, ferny blue-green leaf to it. Um, Jack in the pulpit, Arisema triphylum. Mine is about at this stage right now, uh, and I, I adore this plant uh, because it's it's a little weird, let's face it. Uh, it's very unique in its flowering. And I'll, sometimes you'll get a, some purple striping on those stem, in the stem and the flower. Uh, the bunnies don't seem to eat it, thank goodness. Uh, and this is one of those plants that is, um, all the plant parts uh, do have some alkaloids that are irritating. So it is regarded usually as poisonous. Uh, but the birds in, will definitely eat the berries, but do not recommend. And if you have, a dog who eats plants, this may not be a candidate for the garden, but it is such an unusual distinct flower and um, they go average to moist and they will slowly colonize a little bit. Uh, and they are just really interesting, just a, just a unique shape. <clears throat> Dodecathion media, our shooting star is blooming now. Um, this happens, this was, if you get a chance, Little Red Schoolhouse has some really wonderful wildflowers. This is another ephemeral. It holds on for a long time, but it will eventually go dormant in July. So those leaves will start to uh, wither <clears throat> and fade in late July. But these are a bumblebee plant. So the bumblebees um, actually go to this plant for the pollen more than the nectar. It doesn't offer a lot of nectar, but it does in pollen. And to get that pollen out, the bumblebees have to shimmy on the, and shake that flower. So they do this little bee shimmy, uh, which is a lot of fun to watch. Uh, and then once those um, flowers are pollinated, they start to reflex back upwards. And so the seed pods are held more upright, almost like a crown or a chandelier. A uh, very distinct flower and just a lot of fun in the yard. A lot of, uh, I have them scattered everywhere because I just, I, I'm very fond of that. Very different flower. Um, geranium maculatum is popping into bloom. Our wild geranium, and this one gives you this kind of pinky to pinky lavender flower. Um, again, great pollinator plant. And then that foliage will have uh, tones of red in the fall. It's a really easygoing, um, geranium as a whole is just an easygoing genus. It's pretty straightforward. It's um, pretty happy wherever you stick it. Uh, part, it'll go part to full shade. Mine is trying to colonize along my driveway <laughs> and I'm just kind of, I'm rather inclined to let it because it's just a lovely, lovely plant. Um, ostrich fern is kicking into gear now. Uh, ostrich fern, I, this for me is the indestructible fern. It'll go anywhere from wet to average and I even, I'll, it'll try, it's not, dry soil isn't its favorite, but it's stubborn and it'll go for it. Uh, I do have some underneath my Norway spruce, which is like a desert. Uh, you can eat the fiddleheads when they are young and they kind of taste like green beans crossed with, asparag crossed with asparagus. But this is your classic big shuttlecock fern. And it's, um, it will definitely spread. Uh, it'll send up by roots. It'll kind of start popping up little friends. I thin the herd every about five years or so and kind of give it away or move it around. <clears throat> We'll see how big they are this year. In past springs, when we've had wet springs, they get four feet high. This year, I will not be surprised if they're smaller because we've been dry. Um, Bishop's cap might tell us. So this one's a little bit more of an unusual native. And this is one of those that you may have to kind of uh, hit the mail order folks for this guy. 
it is becoming more popular and it, it is a very easygoing perennial, but it's um, one of those I grow for this wonderful, it's about the same um, textures as hookra, but it has snowflake flowers on it. And the little bitty bugs love them. Our little Searford flies adore them. And when they set seed, they get two seeds in each little cup. So it's like a little teacup with two little black seeds. And then it keeps those leaves all summer. Um, the rabbits do like it. So this is one I'm out there with the repellent because I wait for those flowers all year. And as soon as they start to bloom is when the bunnies eat them, the little buggers. Um, but I keep trying. <laughs> so, and they'll, they, this one, if it, um, boy, it, it's very, it's a slow clumper. It is slow moving. So it's one of those things. Um, it, they're an unusual little treasure. Uh, Pulmonium, it's blooming its full head off right now. Jacob's Ladder, another one of those really lovely sky blue flowers. When the uh, leaves first emerge, they're purple which is always something I, I like to look for early in the spring. And of course, our you know, great pollinator plant, another very easygoing perennial for us. Um, I find it all up and down the roads of the Arboretum in the woods. And um, I, I've uh, kind of, I've added more and more to the yard just because I, I like that delicate uh, texture in with hostas to kind of balance off those big coarse leaves into the dry side for shade. The dry shade, the hardest place to plant, I, I swear. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Carex Pennsylvanica. So this is Carex Pennsylvanica as a ground cover. As you can see, it gets eight inches high and then it sort of flops over a little bit. It's very delicate in its texture, but it also, you know, as the other sedges, again, a host, a plant for butterflies and moths, um, and a seed source for songbirds. And it can give you a really interesting grassy texture, um, especially with bigger, coarser plants in the shade. And it is very adaptable. <clears throat> my pat, my big patch is underneath my beech tree and it just keeps getting, it's slowly expanding because um, it's really dry under that beech tree, uh, but it, it's pretty happy camper. Um, and then Carex radiata, and this is the flower in radiata, which is a starry, it's a very um, charming little flower on it, and very, you know, just delicate and, and lovely, but a more upright sedge than pen sedge, so if you're looking for something that's going to be a stiffer, more upright blade, this is a great choice, and again, it's just a tough as nails little plant. Northern Blazing Star. This is our woodland, um, Blazing Star, our woodland Leatris. And its flowers are held, um, this is the other form of flowering you'll see in Leatris, is these big fat buttons um, of flower clusters. And our, our token skipper butterfly, because you know it's a Leatris, it's gonna have somebody on it all the time. Uh, and this is a later blooming one. It's gonna start blooming in August. So it gives us some ball flowers, which is always lovely. Uh, and again, it's about two, a little bit smaller, a little, it's about two feet high. Um, and again, always a wonderful cut flower. Uh, Penstemon hirsutus or hairy beard tongue. Um, and the, um, so this is a smaller uh, Penstemon. It's blooms pink, uh, kind of a pale pink to white and it handles um, dry shade. So it's, um, and again, it's not especially fast moving. It, it's, you know, it's slowly gonna create these cute little clumps of, of uh, foliage. Um, but again, it's a wonderful, wonderful hummingbird plant. Um, and I, I've been uh, planting it because I, I, have a, I have a soft spot for penstemon. It's, it's taken about four years to come into its own. So um, be patient with this one, but it, it's, and then it bloom, it just, it blooms very young and it blooms for about six weeks. Um, Christmas fern, so Christmas fern, uh, we, they were sold this at the Arboretum plant sale this past, I, past weekend and I'm sure I, I, I sold quite a few to people. Um, I have mine underneath my peak and lilac tree. Uh, and this is one you're gonna find on bluffs at Starved Rock. Uh, it tolerates dry really beautifully. Uh, it is somewhat evergreen. 
Um, so a cold Christmas fern, because it's usually still green on Christmas. And um, it's going to be a more of a flatter, wider fern than the shuttlecock of ostrich fern. So dark green, leathery, really a, just a wonderful addition to the fern garden. And um, this is one I watched the bunnies on it. They, they can eat the early fiddleheads, but um, my, it's taken about three years for mine to start expanding. Uh, and, and so again, not a fast mover, which is nice if you want it to stay put. Um, Saladago Cesia, this is blue stem goldenrod. This is one of our woodland goldenrods. And as you can see, it blooms along the stem. So it's much more of a arcing uh, uh, shape to it. And um, as opposed to our, like our, our showy Soladago that likes, that has the puff of flowers at the end. So this one is more flowers all along the stem, uh, gives you a different texture in the yard. And with all the, again, August to October, so this is a really late season flower, and it's going to give our pollinators a, a great pit stop before migration, or as a wonderful resource before hibernation. Um, so all of all of the goldenrods feed a lot of stuff late in the season. <clears throat> Shorts aster is a shorter aster at <laughs> three feet, as opposed to my New England aster, which wants to be like six feet. <laughs> um, and it handles dry shade. So this is more of a woodland aster. Uh, and like the goldenrod, also you know, host plant to a bunch of moths. Um, and a great late season uh, nectar source. So, and they also look terrific in the vase. They're just a fun, easy daisy flower. Uh, so I know we have a ton of questions. So before we go, this is my rain garden in June. So hopefully in another few months, this is kind of, as you can see, I, I have not gotten into common milkweed because it can be a bit thuggish in the garden. Uh, I do thin out the herd every once in a while. Um, and then my, my prairie dock is, is tucked back in there with, with a lot of competition. Um, so we are going to go ahead and take questions, uh, of which there are a bunch. So I'm going to start at the beginning here. Um, OK, so we had a question on the study uh, from Mount Cuba. Let me pull that up for you. Give me just a second. Um, and uh, we will I'll link that in there. Um, it is echinacea for the mid-Atlantic region, but Honestly, I think that we can, you know, it'll definitely, it's not too different um, than the Midwest uh, climate-wise. There we go, get that link in there for you. Um, and then you can read it to your heart's content. Uh, it's, a, it was a, um, it's a really, it's a very, uh, it's got a summary, it's got details, it's got a little bit of everything. Um, will rabbits eat New Jersey tea? Probably. At this point with rabbits, baby bunnies try everything, as we well know. Um, I can't, I will not say that it's necessarily a favorite, um, but let me, let's see if I can um, find that out for you. Um, yeah, so, okay. So unfortunately, yes, bunnies eat New Jersey tea. So I would likely fence it over the winter um, because I suspect that that's more when they're gonna eat it as opposed to now when there's lots of other things to eat. Um, but of course, in the winter when rabbits are starving, it's a different story. Um, Okay, uh, is Rosa Blanda invasive? I think we talked about that. I don't, I would say no. Uh, the second hibiscus we have here, and I will, let me type the name for the other species of, can I type and talk at the same time? No, <laughs> sorry. And I always have to look it up the spelling on Mashudos um, because, oh, wait, I hang on a second. Um, this looks like we may have had a name change on hibiscus machutos. Uh, let's see. Nope, there it is. Okay. Every once in a while, taxonomy catches up with you and they uh, change the name on something. Um, 
Okay, uh, Baptista Bracteata. So probably your best source at this point would be Possibility Place in uh, Moni. They specialize in native plants. Mo of the plants in this um, presentation, I have um, gone with ones uh, that are typically available at independent garden centers. Um, independent garden centers are carrying natives more and more, um, but it's been, it is a wild year. Last year was crazy, this year also crazy. We welcomed 20 million new baby gardeners. As an industry, I don't think we were quite ready for them all to show up at the same time. Uh, so plant supply is really tricky. Um, we, growers are growing plants as fast as they possibly can. But petunia crop, you can flip in like six to eight weeks. You can't do that with some of these, um, some of the natives and some of the perennials and not the trees, at, you know, not, not, are not just, it takes 10 years to grow a tree. Um, so should we water our native plants because it's been so dry? Whoo, it kind of depends on the plant. I am at the point where I am giving my uh, my water lovers, the stuff in the bottom of the rain garden, I have um, extra water. It does get a spray. I am watering, um, not a ton, but I am kind of giving it some extra uh, as I've got, I've got some Japanese iris that's um, you know, almost a while in that. So, um, but as far as like, I haven't started watering the trees yet. <clears throat> I keep hoping that we'll get a decent rain. And so far my hopes have not materialized. Um, Pen sedge does not stay green all year round. Uh, it does go, it does have a dormancy to it. It's a sedge. I also, I don't clean up my sedges um, because the birds will use the old foliage for nesting. Um, and my grasses and my, I leave my plants up all winter. Um, I will, I cut them and leave them in the beds in the spring. Um, especially grasses, I'll cut, it, I'll cut them into like six or eight inch pieces and just drop them and let them be mulch. Um, I, it does pay off. Uh, I've been watching this week, we have a female Oriole who has been combing through uh, the gardens, picking up nesting material. She's pulling uh, grasses um, and old stems and she's, I think she's trying to shred the milkweed. I'm not, but she's, she's building a nest. Um, the tall white flowering plant next to the queen of the prairie in my rain garden picture, that's actually Becky daisies. Because, you know, I, um, I have over 60 species of natives in the yard, but I'm by no means native only in my, um, in my gardens. It's a mix. So, uh, and I gotta say, I got a soft spot for Bucky daisies. So that's the spot they like. I've tried them all over the place, but, um, and then, Okay. Um, the wild white indigo. Yeah, there's a, you know, it's one of those, um, the Baptisia, sorry, with the, we have a new gardener and everything came back in the rain garden except the wild white indigo. Um, it's very possible it's taking its sweet time. Uh, I am just starting to see, I have some, I've not even seen my common milkweed pop up yet. Um, We've had some warm days, so I expect to have it show up, but it's not unusual for it to be a little pokey. Um, and it kind of looks like asparagus when it's first coming up. Uh, and that's what you're gonna be looking for. So, um, and if it's a newer plant, it also may take a little time to turn up in the garden. And oh no, somebody got someone's New Jersey tea. Oh dear, that's very sad. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and you can pop any more questions in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself, um, have at anything else I can answer. I've stunned you into submission. Yeah, so if there's any more questions, please feel free to add them to the chat or unmute yourself. Um, that was a great presentation, Heather. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I wrote Isha. down a number of things to look at for next year. <laughs> Isha, Baptisia alba, does it grow in the dry soil or moist? Uh, let me double check because I always have to, um, 
I, for me, I want to say it's going to be average to dry, but let me take a, let me double check um, because the brain only holds so much sometimes. <laughs> so, I have a question um, on cardinal flowers. How, how do they how do they spread? Because I've been babying one for about three years now and it's still just a single stalk. You know, and that's kind of what they do. It's just like one stalk here, one stalk there. Okay. Um, and I'm, okay, so and it, the answer to that Baptisia question was um, dry to average soils. Uh, and then I'm also gonna give you guys in the chat, um, this is, one of the gold standard for plant information is the Missouri Botanic Garden um, plant finder. It has thousands and thousands and thousands and they're, it's terrific. Um, and they actually keep it very, very updated. Um, and I'm sorry, I may have missed a question. So, um, I think you were for... looking something up right before oh, the, the cardinal plant question. Oh yeah, so Baptisia, Baptisia alba is dry to average cardinal plant. Yes, it's one stem here, one stem there. I've seen it, I've, like if you look, there's a bunch of it planted in the big rain gardens at Cantini by the parking lot. It is, it's just a, a stem here, a stem there. It doesn't, it's not a clumper. Um, I love I've that. seen it in a lot of shade, but again, it's like, one stem there it's just that seems to be what it does um and it wouldn't for that one i would expect it to take its sweet time yeah, to slow. Uh, you know yeah it's just not a fast mover okay. um and there was a question in the chat about the globe master allium that's yes. ready to bloom is it safe yeah. to move them or should uh, i would wait wait i mean it's a tough bugger of a plant. But the thing is, when it's blooming, is all the resources of the bulb are now kind of moved into the leaves and the flowers. So if you're going to move the allium, I would wait until it finishes blooming and starts to wither um, and go dormant, because then it's pulling back all those resources into the bulb. And it's going to be a lot easier to move, and you don't risk, you know, kind of damaging roots or anything like that. And then you can just move it wherever. It's a pretty durable um, bulb. But yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't move it in flower. I, I, I'd wait. Um, and then I don't know, but there's another rabbit question. Yeah, uh, bunnies eat roses. Yes, they do. Absolutely. <laughs> and I lost, I lost, I mail ordered some heirloom roses. And I lost them to the rabbits and I'm mad at myself. I should have just caged the stupid things because they came really tiny, but I didn't. And it's my own fault. <laughs> ah, and um, yeah, and uh, so um, as for Northern Blazing Star, the Liatris, I don't, it's not so much that the, ra the rabbits eat the foliage, what you gotta watch for on the Liatris is because it's a tiny little corm, is the voles in the, eating the corm in the winter. Um, I think you're okay on the bunnies with Northern Blazing Star. Uh, but again, if you've got tons of them, it's, it's keep an eye on it and get, you know, have that, that gallon jug of, of repellent at, the ha at, at handy. Um, with the other thing with rabbits is I balance between about three different products because they figure it out uh, and th they're smart little bastards. Um, so I bounce, I've got three different formulations of repellent and I will kind of use one each year because the stupid, the rabbits catch on. Um, yeah, they don't seem to eat the liatris foliage, but I don't, I don't trust them farther than, you know. So, and the other thing with cardinal flower is, uh, is I, moisture is so important with that one. Uh, that one, if you're not watering it, I probably would water it now. So, all right. Anybody else? Any other questions? Oh. And let me pop that presentation link in there before I forget. And I will email the um, 
presentation and handout links out after um, probably tomorrow. Okay. You said everybody has them. All right. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, this was a really great presentation. I loved all, all the pictures and the, the hints and had so many ideas for next year. <laughs> <laughs> <Pretty big yard. laughs> and this is the short list. So. <laughs> all right. I am going to go ahead and end.